Former hedge fund manager Hugh Henry is best known as the man who made 30% in 2008 when others crashed in the global financial crisis, including many so-called hedge funds. He described his cockroach mandate as being a survivor no matter what. He closed the fund in 2017 after a period of lacklustre but far from shocking performance and has become a property developer and landlord of upmarket rentals on the billionaire favourite Caribbean hideaway of St Bart's. But few owners of vacation lets could tell you what the 10-year bill did in the last month, let alone give a coherent view of how it might move in 2022. Hugh may have retired, but he's certainly not let go. He views the world through a different prism. He's like a photographer who only uses a fisheye lens. We recorded this episode in a cold London day and on St Bart's it was just as windy as you may hear. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. This podcast is intended to educate as well as entertain, and it has a more serious purpose. We are big supporters of the Financial Times Financial Literacy and Inclusion Campaign, a new charity which you can check out on ft.com forward slash FLIC. It's the most disadvantaged in society who often get taken in by financial scams, by payday loans, and similar artful devices to part people with their money. We can change this. It's a straightforward task of education. This really is a great cause, and I urge you, please, to support it. The podcast is sponsored by Sentio, and I ask them because I use the research platform almost every day. For equity analysts, it's in many respects the ideal tool. If I didn't have a professional platform, I would need several different software systems. Sentio saves me a lot of time and ensures my research can be done in one place. I like it because first, the data is reliable and it aggregates all content. Second, it's easy to use and much more intuitive than some other platforms. Third, it has features I have never seen in other systems. My favourite is the ability to go into 10K and extract the history for a particular data table. If I want to see the trend in a parameter, and I often do this, I snap my fingers without having to dig through multiple 10Ks. It's much faster and easier. But most important is the price. There's a huge price advantage over other systems. If you're a smaller fund or even a larger fund equipping analysts, Sentio is definitely worth looking at. Visit sentio.com forward slash BTBS for behind the balance sheet for more details. So, Hugh, thanks very much for coming on. Can you tell us, how did you get into investing in the first place? Um, yeah, I can, I can remember it very clearly. Um, I, <laughs> I, I may as well say I was at a polytechnic, I was at, which is very unfair, actually. I was at Strathclyde University, but it's, you know, Fine, a uh, fine university. All the best, all the best Glaswegian hedge fund people graduated from Strathclyde. It's such a it's such a huge population base, but yeah. um, but to there, well, long and short story, um, short story. Um, I in my final year, so I I did a, um, a final honours year, and actually I'd been paid or sponsored by uh, KPMG. Um, Pete Mauric McClintock in in uh, Glasgow to join them after my my graduation and dedicate my life to the world of accountancy. <laughs> Can you imagine me? Um, <laughs> so there I was, and I was completing my fourth year, and uh, there was a I was studying market based accounting research. Uh, but you actually you sat down in front of a data stream, the old. The original, if you will, where Bloomberg came from, where Reuters came from, all began with a, a, a crappy uh, data stream thing, and it was like seeing another universe. And the, the, what we were studying, we were we were seeking to determine um, whether markets reacted to a 
changes in accounting policy. So, which is to say, did markets care for accountancy? And you would be testing changes which would have a material impact on the cash flow and therefore the valuation of the business and therefore should really be taken seriously um, versus um, changes in depreciation policy, which may affect profitability or the reporting of, but certainly not the substantive value of the business. And I just, it was, it was the hook. It was just, um, you know, it was like David Attenborough, or like wildlife, like watching to see if, if there would be, you know, if the mice would come for the cheese or not. And, and so that literally in that final year, I thought, oh, I kind of like, I was always watching people. I never drank I, alcohol. I never, sm I had no vices. My life's in reverse. I'm, I seek a vice every day now, but back then I had none. Um, and I, you know, I, after the union, I would be sober <laughs> and terrified, but and recording everything. And so I was a recorder, if you will. And so the two came together and I made it happen. That's very funny. Um, the idea of somebody being um, sober in the students union that's, um, in Glasgow is probably there's is pr probably that you could get charged if they if they found you. So, I mean, your your story is pretty well documented, isn't it? You know, you went to Bailey Gifford and then you end up at OD and then you set up on your own. So you you quit in 2017, was it? Quit. I, I closed my hedge fund in, at the end of 2017. At, at the end of 2017, I'd, I'd been, I had been living, I'd committed to living in St. Uh, St. Bart's, where I am now, in March of 2015, and I was kind of managing the fund remotely or advising, etc., back and forward to London. And then at the end of 17, um, <laughs> talk about fate um, or, or, or whatever, but you know this island was struck by one of probably the greatest hurricanes and i had um in at the end of 2015 i completed this like gin palace of a of a of an investment for um the the, the rental um in saint bart's and we we nearly lost that and i'd been sitting in london watching do you know i was watching a camera which was fixated on a palm tree and i thought if that palm tree holds up against this terrible storm, my house will be safe. And what I didn't realize is the batteries had gone, you know, the, the camera had been destroyed hours before, but it had gone back to loop. And I was watching the same damn tree over and over again. <laughs> the house was closed for nine months. Um, we got a redemption, the same week as the storm, redemption from the largest remaining client. Uh, it had been barely profitable. Uh, and now it was it was untenable. And so, yes, the end of 2017, I closed the hedge fund. And so, what did you decide to do? I mean, I, I can't quite imagine. You know, I, I I think it must be very nice living in St. Bart's, but I can't quite imagine how you could go from doing that job, which is like sort of full on all day every day, to lying on the beach, maybe doing a bit of gym in the morning and, a, a, you know, the old yoga class. I mean, how do you transition? Well, um, you know, I, I had spent a life um, pursuing or spent a life in the future and, and that's not a healthy activity. And so, you know, there was healing, there was a uh, necessity of healing and uh, closure kind of felt like failure um, and having to deal with that and so yeah i was you know i, I was in a beautiful cave um this island has has great natural beauty and and actually they they say that uh, th these kind of wow factors that emerge from from nature they are like like taking magic mushrooms or whatever they they kind of heal your you know some of the the damage uh, that's they, the the in the neural pathways and, and what have you and you're right i i certainly am not the type to laser around and um and i, I have a, a full-on activity here but you know if i if i thought closing not being actively engaged in the management of other people's money would be less stressful i was deluding myself because it's just the fact that i was born to worry and 
and I had found a well remunerated activity for worrying. Um, and now I find myself worrying almost to the same epic scale, but for the most preposterously mundane reasons. <laughs> well, what's our reasons? Um, my villa manager, the cleaning ladies, uh, the remuner remuneration package, you know, we, uh, we have been applying the, uh, the, the sheet that goes around the, the mattress in the, the master and the captain's bedroom. Um, and it has a particularly large um, mattress bed and we're using a size that's too small. Um, and that re like detail, detail and everything in life is crucially important. And that detail not being right and trying to get it through to people. And, and obviously um, I'm, I'm working with people with different kind of pay levels and therefore the skill sets that they bring is perhaps not what I'm accustomed to. And so you've kind of got to be able to you know, accept that you're, accept that there's going to be dumbass things going on. And, and I guess that's why we have the wow of nature in this beautiful place. And we have, I can go surfing and I can do yoga and I can play tennis and, you know, whatever uh, t t to, to help me deal with, <laughs> with some of the crazy stuff. And I mean, are you still investing for your own account? You're not doing that really fancy stuff anymore, presumably, but you're, you're are you still sort of active? Uh, no, no. Um, all of my, um, I mean, my my act, my my active engagement, the active engagement of my capital, is in in building um, these um, these gin policies in St. Bart's. They are uh, notoriously expensive. Uh, the land to buy and and then construction. Uh, I mean, my construction budget on the latest project has has doubled, and in the last year trying to get loans processed through, trying to get loans processed by a French bank uh, in, in the normal course of everyday life is challenging. When you have COVID and everything else, um, it has been uh, torturous. So, um, you know, uh, the present project is going to end up being about 13 million euros. So almost $15 or 14 a bit dollars, I think. Um, and you know a hefty slug of, of so it, it it doesn't you know and it's a cash flow it's a it's a asset price appreciation really there's a bit of positive carry but um in terms of the positive carry allows it's a positive carry for my lifestyle but it doesn't allow enough to reinvest again um but you know i'm notionally i'm i'm, I'm investing 20 year fixed at 1.3 percent i'm buying um on this tiny tiny island which is coveted by billionaires um, and it's getting harder and harder for permission to, to build these properties so it's you know it would seem like it's a macro trade but regardless of all of that and the the what i find amazing is my mind in the background is still processing you know i i a year ago i committed to, committed I don't, know if, I don't know if I committed but I started appearing in platforms like this and my own because the voices in my head are still registering despite mm. the distance that I had I I pushed back and and yet I was kind of haphazardly meeting people in the industry and this this person was talking and about what's going on I'm like who is this it was me and 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 actually I miss that. I miss the thrill of these conversations. I don't know what you're going to ask me next. You know, I, I like that, that kind of live, kind of jazzy thing, improvisation. There's a very um, funny noise. Can you hear? There's a sort of funny noise with the microphone. Is it just the wind in the background? Wind and th there's a. You know, we've got the we've got some construction going on. So every now and right, again, don't worry, don't worry. I'm sure um, they'll be able to edit it out. I'm breaking so, every um, rule on your cheat sheet. The house the, is open. You know, there are no carpets. There, are, I did switch the ice machine off. But. That was kind. No, I, I, it's very funny because I'm talking to you from an edit suite, and the office I was in was all glass. And so it was like the worst possible environment for recording a, a, a podcast. So I was really curious. So I, I'm slightly jealous of your YouTube and Instagram 
both your followers and the content because it's very visual and it looks I mean it looks really good so I do these YouTube videos but I just, it's just basically me like this in front of the camera with a few PowerPoints to, and and I committed to doing one a week for a year and so like on Friday last week I thought oh dear I've not done my one for the week I better think of something and the quality is not quite what it what it should be whereas yours is always are very beautiful very elegant but what I was curious about was in the past your letters when I was lucky enough to get hold of one were always fantastic and you you know the written word it was amazing why have you moved to this sort of visual emphasis is it is that something you always wanted to do or I I, I was all, always visual you know right back to the beginning the the market-based accounting research was the visualization of a theory it, it was taking the form of a shape of a, a developing shape and a developing trend and it was allowing me to to be an audience to something and my career really took off i mean it took off in different stages in, in edinburgh with bailey gifford it was a you know a remarkably solid and thorough and very intellectual um review of the world and uh, and a particular way of dissecting the world and a particular style and it was it was rich and deep and engrossing um but i truth be told i i didn't thrive in that environment if anything i I, mean, I, I was at best i was going sideways and if they had been less um successful they would have they would have had the need to fire me um, and after eight years um, I did leave, and I think fate can lend a hand in events. And I found myself working with Crispin, Crispin Odie, and, and he was colourful as a person, and and he was using charts um, and 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 creating a dialogue with these charts. And initially, I was sceptical from owing to where I come from, but I found that. The, the visualization allowed me to then fire up rich uh, narratives in my head. And those papers would be the, or the portfolio would be a result, but the, the papers as well. And you know, the papers always had, they always had reference to, to music or, or literature. You know, there's an idea that great works of fiction, I mean, you should all read, read but a great, great friend, um, professor of English literature, Angus Fraser, um, in, in America, who's teaching creativity to Navy SEALs. Um, and, and creativity is something corporations do. Where did, where's it gone? We need this thing to change things. Um, and, you know, I got taught creativity with Crispin, the, you know, to um, break rules, to misbehave, to touch hot plates, to, to dare to be different. Um, but also, back to Angus and, and the English, uh, reading is like, it's, you don't have to play these virtual reality games. A, a reading a book is a virtual reality where you are forced, you're taking the decisions of the principal characters before they take them. And then you go, oh no, that's stupid, or oh, I missed that, and whatever. And so for me, I found that I found inspiration. I, I, I was able to unlock and answer some of the riddles in my head with regard to risk positions from coming across pieces of music or magazine articles or books and i still do that and if you the instagram always is the the, the touchstone is is our words and and despite i mean I, I paid a lot of money for you know a, a graphic deck of photographs and, and we made some uh, some videos in, in paris um but on top of that is very word loaded and and again it's words which these are the words i said to you that i've got this back processing engine and it's still working away because it's still picking up all of these kind of fiction password keys or password password unlock keys which are allowing me to say something so i would say it's just an extension of what i was always doing i mean the videos are, are brilliant <laughs> the one with you in the bath reading the financial times is quite quite i mean they're they're great fun and they're really really entertaining but i mean do, is there a purpose behind this is it just something that you just needed to to do something and are you are you planning on on becoming a a, a financial influencer which i mean obviously you're much better at this than i am but you know um it's it seems 
it seems slightly odd because not many people with your skills are prepared to share your knowledge with Joe Public. And I think it's quite nice, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what am I? My principal aim just now is to finish this damn house in St. Paul's, this damn $13 million project. Um, that um, film that you kindly referenced in Paris, almost almost a screen test. You know, I've, I've done a lot of uh, TV work. Um, tell me my secrets. Um, the, um, but yeah, I, I wanted to make something. I, I, would, I was, I'm sure you're, you're the same. Do you remember the, um, t to use the name that he prefers, Neil Ferguson, as opposed to Niall Ferguson, but anyway. Uh, but Neil Ferguson, uh, when he first came to my attention, he was plugging one of his wonderful books, and it was on Channel 4, the, one of the uh, terrestrial channels in the United Kingdom, and they gave him a huge budget, and I think it was, you know, he was going on, going to Turkey and all parts of the world, and, and explaining the economic history of how we arrived at where we are today. And I love that. Um, I, and I'd love to, you know, um, I'd love to do something like that. So my problem is I've not, um, I've not been able to commit the same amount of time, um, but I'm hoping at some point, I need someone actually. Um, I, and again, I, I really run cash flow constrained and I, I need someone to, to edit my, my uh, like, like these, these engagements and things. But I'm hoping on top of that, I, I, I am planning on releasing a book um, and I was, I was going to ask that. When is the book coming out? And what's it going to be about? It's going to be about me. Um, so I, I want to write um, a kind of, again, let's be preposterous, but a kind of a rock star type memoir of investing because they're all really dull. And, and yet I, I remember being a grown adult and, and, and just loving you know the Jesse Livermore's and the the original Jack Schwager series and it was adventure and, and it was characters you know it was guys that, would, that had live grenades and they would kind of think about pulling the plug and they would talk about their dreams and how their dreams would come true in the in the US job jobless data claims data and I it was just it was rock it, for me it was like rock and roll adventure and I I with those letters that you refer to originally it was to kind of put those letters into a kind of book format and then we kind of moved away because actually when i worked at bailey gifford there was uh, that's it well my, my background is actually kind of probably the best part of the story um working at bailey gifford working yeah i, I had a lot of engagement with um what's he called james anderson who now of course with the tesla and amazon and all the rest has really taken on the mantle of probably the most outstanding British investor of the last three decades. And that, the tale of him and me is, uh, is kind of rocky. It's kind of funny that, you know, there was a, there was, God, did we, did we clash? And, and that's kind of funny and interesting. And then there's, of course, the story of, of London rocking up and then, in, in, well, first of all, working at Credit Suisse and being very dismissive of, of that, and then being rescued, being almost fired then, and then being rescued by Crispin and you know Crispin's three books in, in one, um, etc. So I it's it's kind of written, um, and it needs editing, and I think I'm going to have to self-publish because you can imagine you know one of the big finance publishers came back and said, but we we publish finance books. Like, but actually, because I don't want to, I, I, I want to cross over. I want, I want people to read it because it's a, it's kind of funny and it's rollicking. It's one of those things. If it's done properly and delivered properly, it's not long. It's Sixty-five thousand words. Um, you can read it in two and a half hours or something. And it's one. It's like da 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 da. It's all light and silly, but it's, it's, it's pace. It's a, it's a story. And you know the same parts and coming here on speedboats and helicopters and, you know and and having a kind of a, a van which took me to the court so I was on a Friday which was done up like a, a private jet and you know and my wife really, you're just a wonder <laughs> 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 oh 
Well, I can't. I can't wait. I can't wait to. I can't wait to read it. Uh, going back to Neil Ferguson, he he of course is a fellow Glaswegian, and um, I met him at one of the CLSA conferences in Hong Kong, and he was speaking, and um, there was a guy in the audience who looked exactly like him, and he was very excited about this the idea of having a doppelganger. And um, I bumped into the various conferences over the years, and he, he's a really uh, amazing guy because he, he's managed to make himself like a global star, doing something which is, you know, you would have thought at a very narrow audience. And I imagine that you could do the same, right? Because you can make this stuff come to life, and you make it very interesting. So I, I mean, I think your book will do brilliantly. And, you know, very happy to introduce you. My publisher will, will for sure will be interested in it. Although, whether you want to go with a publisher or self-publish, that's, yeah. uh, and, you know. The, and also the, now you've got Substack. Uh, so I'm probably going to go Substack first and then publish. Really? And then, and then you know, the audio is very popular. And I am coming to terms with the fact that I sound like this. People like it. I don't like it, but people, people like it. And so uh, an audio book probably works with me and the rest of the world. Well, I, funnily enough, so I published a book about a year ago, and they said, oh, do you want to dictate the audio book? And I said, oh, no, because people would hate my accent. And they, the way they do it is they, they, they audition all these people, and they send you the, the, the recordings. And they do, like, the foreword or something. And they were all terrible. And I, I mean, there were, I mean, obviously, my book wasn't very exciting. And so I wanted to have somebody that was, you know, not really dull and boring. And there was only one person that sounded at all cheerful reading it. And so I picked them. And then when they actually recorded the book, they weren't at all cheerful. And it, I mean, I can't even bear to listen to it. I should have. So I would recommend you do it yourself, actually. Yeah, I will do. I will do. So, um, Look, what um, you, it was interesting you were talking about charts because charts were a massive thing for you when you were running your fund. I mean, to what extent were you a chartist and to what extent were you a fundamental guy? Uh, good question. Um, I, you know, I, I forgive me if it's rehearsed or it sounds rehearsed, but um, I was an oxymoron and I was at great lengths for people to like. I was happier to be called an oxymoron as opposed to a moron. Um, <laughs> but I was always engaged in two things which seemed to be in conflict with one another. And, and obviously fundamentals and, ch and chartism seems to be like that. Um, I recall actually that this, it, it wasn't a light bulb moment, a spontaneous light bulb moment. It came many years later, but in Edinburgh, um, who was in my intake, if you will, at Bailey Gifford, um, had had to kind of respond um, to the the the, uh, the global team meeting once a week. Uh, uh, she worked in the European team, and there was always a kind of you had to come up with something snappy about uh, new stocks that had been purchased for the portfolio. And she was a bit unprepared, and the partners were always kind of really intense. And they're like, you know, come on, come on, you know, why did we buy this uh, Danish chicken company, you know? And, and she went, because it keeps going up. And we all went, and Mark started laughing. And it was only years later, I thought, that's genius. She bought it <laughs> because it's going up. And that's what I was doing that left, so left alone, so in my seven, eight years, catastrophic years at Bailey Gifford, without uh, the, the, the chart element, I was rich in fundamentals, great processing, processing power, worked with people I really, really admire, and worked in teams where we made no money, just nothing, just, we were abysmal. Um, and it comes back, I don't know if you've ever seen the little clip that's on YouTube with me and, um, oh my God, names, um, the a Real Vision, and it is, it's a little chapter headlined, The Conceit and Arrogance of a Well-Formed Argument. 
and I talk about my first disastrous trade in Scotland, and it was a large trade, which was Reader's Digest. And I was shoving down my clever narrative into a sharp uh, position, which was not only refusing to go up, but was clearly going down. And to make matters worse, I was buying every tick lower. And eventually they, they had to pull me out of the out of the trade. I'd have just kept going. And you know what? It went bankrupt, you know. Um, so the, the, the charts uh, um, I found, and I would, it's a claim that I would make for others, that uh, fundamentals alone are not enough. And there is a danger. And personalities, type A characters like me, it lends itself to being overconfident and arrogant and seeing things which are not there. And there's, a, there's just an honesty to buying things that are going up and closing positions when they're going down. And it's also, it's like this argument, I, my, my objective was to have a, an inventory, a warehouse, which was full of rich narrative, smart ideas, but they would become legitimate but the market would make them legitimate and I'd go, hey, pull that one down. And um, so that's, there's another, another time we, we bought Weir Group. I say Weir when I was working at, at Audi. Um, we bought that, I want to say, around about 2005, maybe. And Weir Group is based in Glasgow, of all places. It's a manufacturer of pumps. A large percentage of the demand is uh, derived from mining and exploration. And therefore, of course, it is very, very um, like factor analysis is overloaded by what's happening in the extractive industries and, of course, what's happening to the prices of such uh, commodities. Um, and I, charts and oil prices and gold prices and everything uh, were, were saying to me that I needed representation. The share price of Weir Group was telling me that it was at a point where it, it could perform explosively to the upside because it was trading, it traded in a range for 15 years and it was trading at the high end of that range. And for me, there's an objectivity from strangers having the confidence to pay a higher price than it's traded in 15 years. It kind of reveals some form of knowledge or confidence that they have, which I, I may be lacking at that point. So I, I'm very taken by that. But I remember the, the analyst, one of my partners, and the difficulty that he had, because Weir Group, despite kind of having gone sideways for 15 years, was an extremely well-managed business. Um, and it kind of grew GDP and they kind of, you know, their profitability was robust. And it was always, therefore, highly rated. It was probably on about 1.6 times enterprise value to sales and its average EBIT margins for 12 years had been like 11%. Fair. And my guy was just like, I, I can't really see how you get an explosive price reaction. And I had to say, well, you know, put in $100 oil price. And he's like, oh, well, I would do it, but you know, no one's looking for that. And I was like, well, someone is, I can see it. And you know, if you look at Weir Group from 2005, it, it, I don't know, tripled, quadrupled, you know. Been a... it, did, it did very well, actually. I was, I, I was involved as well. It was, it was fracking that helped because the pumps were used in, in the yeah. U.S. shale. And, um, but that's no, a great example. How do you remember what it was trading at? I mean, that's 15 years ago. Oh, but, and, you've, but, and you've done, you, I mean, you, you know, you can, you've been short the Hungarian florin and done all these like weird things in between. How can you remember the, the valuation? Do you just have that sort of mind? Um, I don't have a great mind. I mean, I can't remember names, but um, th th that was a, that's a kind of, I guess that's a go-to area. I've discussed that in the past because I just felt, I felt for the analyst because it was the, pain and the suffering that I had endured in Edinburgh that, again, I wish to say that exclusive reliance upon fundamentals is, is hard, you know, and, and you don't have to make, you don't have to like load everything on your shoulders. You can make light of situations, which is what I did. So I just, I felt the animals were really struggling um, in a manner that I had struggled. And of course, um, and everyone, and what it also revealed was that analysts will not, no one would fact, 
analysts are, are conservative and, and group-like, and they're not, you know, we have to teach people to kind of be brave to be themselves and to, to be brave to be foolish and foolhardy and, and get things wrong but, and, and to make bold claims. You know, we're getting that beaten out of ourselves. Um, and it was one of these things that, you know, to say oil was going to 100 bucks, it went to 150 bucks. But to say it was going to 100 bucks in 2005, three years before, was was heresy. So for all of those reasons, you know, the the, the trading trading live ammunition um, definitely registers. Uh, the photocopier is still working pretty clear. The photocopier when I was five years old, and my parents had a pet can a vicious pet kangaroo in their bedroom. That kind of memory function is a little bit, the tone is a little bit low. Hmm. Now, we're at a very interesting juncture. And so I, I thought, you know, it was interesting to talk to some macro guys because we've had sort of 40 years of falling interest rates or just about 40 years. And I think you made the point that, you know, they started at too high a level. If we look back in 40 years time, if we live that long, um, probably not in, in my case, but if we look back and apart from saying, well, we started, the interest rate started at too low a level, I mean, what will this regime change bring? Because I'm slightly um, frustrated because I'd assumed that the markets would become easier when I had this much experience. And yet all the experience I've got, I can just about throw it out the window because it doesn't mean anything. Right. And, and it's particularly now because I'm a fundamental guy looking at valuations and nobody cares about valuations now. But if we look back going, you know, quite a long time in the future, what, what's going to happen, Hugh? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I find myself quibbling a little bit or reacting because I, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but you seem to imply that we are now in the throes of regime change, which well, is I, I mean, held. Kind of. we, might, we certainly can't have another 40 years of falling interest rates, or can we? I mean, can we just go to interest rates will be negative 5%. I mean, is that what happens? I mean, I, um, uh, something will have to intervene uh, to stop that happening. And I'm not sure what that intervention will be. But without an intervention, then um, the path will continue to seek out lower real rates um, to stabilize the situation, I believe. Um, the, the 40 years or the, the 50 years, um, these, are, these are long times and, and, and typically 40, 50 years, an adult, adult lifetime um, is typically enough to, to, to bring binary change. So we should be anticipating binary change. However, uh, I am very taken by, we, we do like to go back to so inflation, the inflation of the 70s. That was 50 years ago. You know, when, when I started working in Edinburgh, 50 years ago would have been the 1930s. And you know, people wore funny clothes and funny cars. And here we are. And the 70s, you know, I, I was born in 69. I mean, that's like saying you were born in 1929. It seems such a long time ago. But anyway, um, you've got to go back 100 years to find instances of, um, of society changing bouts of high inflation, hyperinflation. Um, and it's still given great relevance. We always go back to these points. Uh, Weimar, China, mainland China suffered. Um, the Japanese suffered. The Japanese military um, executed the Bank of Japan governor. Um, he, his face adorns one of the, uh, the, the notes in Japan. Um, and even you know the 70s, which wasn't hyperinflation, but it was 50 years ago. Um, and there's been a, I don't, I want to say I'm not sure that they are relevant anymore. I, and I say that, can they be relevant when we are um, so indebted and therefore I think it's a bit like nuclear policy uh, or nuclear war that you know if you were to raise rates you, you, you obliterate everyone um, and um, and so it's lost its, its potency 
So um, I, I think the course, like when you look at this year with the undeniably the, the US mainline boom, people definitely have spent a lot of money. Now they've, they were given a lot of money to spend. You know, they were, it's the first time where we've closed the world, but actually pay people to sit there and, and do nothing nothing morally, no, no moral judgment there, I'm just saying that's that's unique. Savings were high and then some of those savings have been drawn down and you know services clearly are still um, under the cosh with COVID and so there's been a lot of uh, demand. But, um, heavens, where was I going with that? So the, um, oh yeah, so and so, you know, like, especially up until, especially the first quarter where U.S. yields were really going, it looks as if they're going to go up to 2%. They flared around about 180, 10-year bond yields from, from lows of 40 basis points. Despite all of that, banks had just haven't stepped up to the plate and lent. There's not, there's either not been the willingness from their credit committees, committees to, to go for it, or there's not been the demand. And at the same time, they've been accumulating huge and huge, huge bundles of cash on their accounts and they have been they're t they're terrified about collateral and losing money and so they're willing to accept almost negative rates so i'm saying to you the, the private banking sector in america seems to be willing to tolerate negative rates would pay negative rates if the fed didn't intervene in day-to-day -day money markets so i think it's there and finally i think the culprit and the thing that has to change um is is china that and china works with your 40-year time cycle because what else happened in the last 40 years china went from its citizens on average earning like a dollar a day to now thankfully earning much more ten thousand dollars a year um, and but the, the way that they have organized their affairs um, has meant that they have taken demand from the west and and given us deflation back and they show no sign of, and not just them, forgive me, not just them, because actually Germany within white, the wider Europe is doing the same. In any of the persistent current account surplus or trade, trade surplus nations of the world are responsible for the deflationary kind of cold shower that we're forced to take every day. And, and the principal mechanism of that is that they and manage, they either manage their exchange rates, um, whereby they, they prevent the market from going to where it wants to go to take out that advantage and, and, and create equilibrium. China, of course, has a, you know, has a dirty float. Um, Europe, you know, Germany, you know, has the euro, which is, you know, not a dirty float, but something else. Um, and then on another thing is um, the domestic labor pool never in enjoys full or never captures fully the productivity that it brings to the table um and so that's why in china um this the consumption is always way below our levels because they don't get rewarded in the manner their productivity would dictate and so there's a deficiency in their own domestic demand which is made up for by you know lunacy investments in property and, and, and fixed asset investments but you i mean do you think um looking at china that all that could change now because if Evergrande goes bust, I mean, maybe it won't go completely I mean, bust. It is, but it is bust, you know. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, obviously, but the, I mean, there's a, a potential knock-on effect on the Chinese, the rich Chinese willingness to buy properties that they leave empty. The, the, the whole thing seems slightly crazy to us in the West. But it seems perfectly natural there. But if you no longer believe that buying an apartment will be a guaranteed gain, if you no longer believe that when you put the deposit down, there's a guarantee that the developer will deliver the apartment, the psychology could change. And this is a market that's not being, it's not a real market. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a market which is like the market in tulips or whatever. So, I mean, could that take quite a lot of the Chinese um, growth away? I mean, is that, I mean, what, what do you think will happen in China? Yeah, so yes to all of that. So one of the riddles just now is that very much 
Um, there is um, in the political economy there are, is an acceptance of a, of a new regime that we have. We have price inflation, um, and I, I want to quibble about that, but whatever. Uh, we have price inflation, um, but the great riddle is that as we you know, 6% plus inflation in Germany, in the US, these are rates of price gain we haven't seen in 15, 20 years, if not longer. And yet, um, those duration government bonds are, the prices are trending higher and they look as if that trend is going to be taking you to lower yields. You know, the US yield has come down from 180 to 135 in the last, you know, three weeks. And chart-wise, it looks as if it could go below one. Um, is there another reason for that? Is that is it the shadow cast by what's going on in China? You know, these are questions that you have to ask yourself. Now, to put things in perspective, um, so you know, I, I kind of got uh, 2008. Um, I, I monetized 2008 rather well. 2008 was a big deal because you were talking about an overvaluation in an asset where where the stock was like two or three x the flow of gdp and so any diminution in in its value was going to be magnified three x you know and was therefore going to be a huge deal and contrast that in the last 10 years i've heard bear cases us is going to crash because of student loan forgiveness or because you know car loans are out of control they're just not big enough okay now us real estate um is I want to say $36 trillion. I say that, actually, I don't believe it. It must be more than that, but I'm going to check again, and maybe you can check. And, um, if I'm way off, you can kind of, you can put a label on, on top. Um, China, I believe, is more like $90 trillion. Um, and that is just, well, again, that's something that, that you think, ooh, okay, to, to be reflected upon. And then what I've been toying with is a, a, a great source of, um, intelligence for me has been another of my partners from Eclectica, Tom Roderick. And he's been working on this idea of the Confucius calendar, you know, the year of the pig and the year of what what have you, that their uh, time system is, is actually ra rad radically different and, and slower, if you will. Think of it them being on a trajectory around the sun, which is um, wider, let's say, it takes longer for them to pass around one revolution of the sun, whereas we're whizzing around it in a year, they're whizzing around it in 12 years, is the analogy that he makes. And so 12 years ago, I found myself, um, I, launched, I raised about $100 million, and it was leveraged to the gunnels, and, and I would have made a billion dollars for the clients, literally a billion dollars, in the event of mainland China like reversing and having a steep recession within you know two or three year uh, price window and we bought remarkably cheap uh, volatility via uh, corporate default swaps in Japanese um, steel companies that were uh, whose business was operationally and financially leveraged and and very vulnerable to what the activities going on in mainland China um, and that didn't come to pass obviously I didn't make a billion dollars for my clients. But the, the thing that sticks in my mind is it was 12 years ago. And 2015 was when Kyle Bass w was in with, you know, the, the currency is going to deval. The Chinese currency just now is about 630 versus the dollar. And back then it was about 720 maybe. And Kyle was saying it was going to trade through nine, if not, you know, um, higher or, or lower valued levels. And again, that didn't work. And for all of the reasons stacked up the thing but the critical variable that wasn't right was a question of time and the 12 years have now kind of come through china's got a 90 has has 90 trillion of value dollar value attributed to property like you say people do not live in them you don't furnish them lights do not go on they are an investment george soros the greatest like investor of all time is going, guys, it's a disaster. And everyone's like, no, you don't understand China. And I'm thinking, actually, it's the clock. It's the clock. It's the 12 year clock and it's ringing. And George recognizes it and it's ringing in his head. And everyone's like, 
No, George, you're such, you're too old for this business. And I'm like, is that's why I think the U.S. Treasury is 135 today, 10 year, and I think it's head, it's going to head to lower yields. I think, because again, we're back into Japanland. They're they're bureaucrats, bureaucrats who govern their bull markets are geniuses. Until there's no longer a bull market, and then they're kind of human, you know. Yeah. Uh, just now they're geniuses, and everyone's like, they'll they'll sort it out, no problem. I'm like, well, you know, I'm watching the ten year. That um, ninety trillion dollar figure, I've never heard that before. I mean, it doesn't seem possible. I mean, it's, it's, it is, I mean, it's possible, obviously. Um, and the thirty. The 36 trillion for US doesn't sound right because it's a bit low. It does. GDP is 21. And so it's got to be, I, I, I think it's got to be at least 3x uh, GDP. Um, but, we'll, but, China but, you, have... regardless, but you know, regardless, um, it's, it's still kind of valid. What we're doing is we're kind of jiving, we're having a micro conversation. And we, we don't keep all these numbers in our heads. We have we have Google, and you know we we search these things. Well, and as fine. soon as we're finished, I'm going to I'm going to look. But I don't know that you'll be able to Google that. But oh, just thinking can. about I, I it, I have. I have. Um, I've got a notepad somewhere. Oh, don't worry. I, can, I mean, I've got an iPad. But uh, let's uh, let's have continue the conversation. Well, I wrote, wrote it down, but anyway, yeah, let's continue. I'll do this. Break. I'll look it up after. But just to think about it, the China has roughly three times the population of the US, but it's obviously got a much lower GDP per head and a large percentage of those people will be living in very basic housing. So if, for it to be 50% more, so if China was 90 and US was 60, it would kind of make, kind of make sense. But what I'll do is I'll do a little web, I do a little web page for each episode. So I'll do a little bit of analysis and I'll send it to you before Great. I publish. Okay. I mean, then, re remember, you're going to find I mean, Japan, the Empress Palace, this you know, like a park, no, no bigger than Hyde Park in London, was was the value of California, the seven. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. So I remember you get, a, you get absurdity. But the other interesting thing is the, the model is very reminiscent of 2007, 2008, because property companies in there in China, their model was very, very similar um, to the Washington Mutual and the Countrywide Financial and indeed the, you know, the US uh, mortgage bank lenders. And, and the thing that was very similar was you could, you, you could get the originator could get rid of the risk rapidly. You could pass it on. And so it was a fantastic, these businesses were like, like that until, until they went bust, right? And they yes. went because they changed the model and you had to own the risk longer and it kills you. As long as you could pass the hot potato on, you were fine. And China, what, what I didn't re realize until very recently was that um, as long as you could demonstrate one third completion, you got all of the money. The, the, the developer got all of the money and therefore could begin on the next project and the next project, which in terms of profitability made these guys probably the best business model for, for incremental profit growth for the last 10 years, these have been the best and they're, you know, the heights of their valuation reflect that. That has now changed. Yeah, and no, I, I think that's the, that's the issue. And if the confidence to the Chinese public was, has changed, then the whole thing doesn't work. And I mean, what, you know, when I look at it, I just think, well, a quarter of the China, Chinese economy is founded on this because you've got all the construction and all the steel and everything else. So, and the municip local municipalities. So if you fundamentally pop the bubble of people's belief that property prices can only go up and that when they put their deposit down, they will get an apartment within a reasonable period, then, you know, that'd be very, very severe for the Chinese economy. And that's the one thing that the authorities couldn't control, I imagine. So I don't know. I mean, I've got no idea if it's going to happen. I don't know if you've got any strong views on it. But I think, I think I, I, again, um, I would tie it up and say, I, I think the 10 year US Treasury is probably going to go back to the lows, if not lower 
uh, over the course of uh, next year. And I, I think one of the head, headwinds or whatever will be that situation in China. And I think the omnipotence of the Chinese bureaucrat will be uh, put to test by the fact that so much of credit these days is conducted in this kind of dark web that we call the, the euro dollar market, which is dollars which are created by banks outside America. Um, that's collateral lending. And it doesn't, all the kind of macro textbook analysis of when countries default or they have, you know, macro issues, it kind of, it doesn't look at, you know, the dark web and the, all, all of this data. And bureaucrats don't help you in that because it's, it's, it's the confidence of banks between themselves. And I reckon overseas are going to, like the risk premium associated with their Chinese brand is going to get higher and higher. That's exactly how the, the Asian crisis of 97 began. It was actually Japanese, the CDS on the biggest bank in, in Japan went to 250. And, and the banks in London, the guys who were, who were, who could trade that stuff were making like who were actually uh, extending overnight uh, loans to the banks at 250 basis points they were making like a year's worth of money in in a week until the risk department came in and said it's trading there for a reason right? you know i'm cutting your line don't do it you know that so i'm we we got a we uh, one of the signs would be uh, C, corporate cds markets and probably in, in uh, the Chinese, I would imagine, would be a, probably a bit heavy and controlling on market prices. But you know, Japanese banks, Korean banks, anyone with a, with a footprint that overlaps China, I think, you know, should for 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 what we've just discussed to be legitimate, we should start to see again footprints in those markets um, of, of some misgiving. Tell me, um, I've been listening to podcasts with Stephanie Kelton and I was on a, a, a show in Asia with uh, Steve Keen who told me not to be so stupid I mean I just don't get this modern monetary theory do you I mean what's your take on it oh uh, modern monetary theory um, it's, it's just the is it's just an, another name and another ism, another club. You know, I'm, I'm not really a club member, um, but um, it is. It's more important to have an open mind and to, to accept that life is absurd. You know, Albert Camus, uh, life is absurd. Just silly things happen, and so um, why? Like, let, let's let's be let's take it into the UK. Why is the ruling Conservative Party? who've got a reputation for fiscal conservatism uh, and you uh, uk sovereign debt to gdp i want to say is about 80 percent and they're desperate to get it lower like why not have it at 120 and, and like be the governing class you know japan has taken the its level from those levels to like over t twice gdp um hasn't done anything so i'm not so on the one hand i'm with MMT, I'm not on that. I'm not on the side of MMT in that it seems to offer a palliative. Hey, just spend more, and we'll get out of it. Um, I'm saying that spend more or don't spend more, it won't make any difference. And if I was a politician, I probably would spend more because people like you. And actually, um, one of the great oddities is there's something about our social democracy in the U.S. and and especially the kind of Anglo-Saxon culture doesn't seem to like um, fixed asset investments. You know, the, the infrastructure in the UK and the US is terrible, you know, and they've just downscaled a, a big, important rail upgrade in, in England to save money. It's like, why are you trying to save money when you can borrow 30 year money at, at negative levels? You know, that is stupidity. So. There's that argument. I would just do those projects. Why does it? Why is it not the answer? And here, as in many things, I, I you mentioned podcasts, and I do a lot of. Uh, I the the one that I listen more often than not to is Jeff Snyder, Making Sense with with the wonderful Emil Kalowski, whatever he's called. Um, and Jeff Jeff's reasoning, which is unsigned, 
scientific in, in, in this regard, but, and that's probably why I like it, but um, spending by, again, by governments, uh, entrepreneurs don't get it. They're like, nah, really? Big deal? You know, it's a bit like what's going on just now. Um, the wages for, um, in the service sector for waiters, for kitchen staff, for, for the guys to do the logistics, the, the truck drivers, um, we're, we're being heard there's huge wage inflation, but at the same time, there's huge shortages because actually the entrepreneurs are going, yeah, businesses, I could use them just now, but if I commit, if I take them, I've got to kind of, I, it's like buying a footballer. It's going to change my wage structure across my, my business. It's going to be disruptive. I ain't sure in six months' time we're going to be as strong as we are today. I'm, I'm kind of skeptical. And there's a, so there's the skepticism. So the, the MMT, I think, it's psychology which undermines the MMT. The US could double its spending um, in the next year. And the private sector, would the private sector rush to make investments in capacity? I think is uncertain. Now, for MMT to, to really seem to work, it would be, you know, without a doubt, giving those checks um, to people who are not billionaires, it would seem that non-billionaires spend money sent from the government on flat screen TVs and, and whatever. Um, to keep that gig going, of course, you've got to do it every year. Uh, you've got to do it, you've got to send those checks in shorter and shorter cycles of time, and you've got to send more and more money. And, and again, I, I don't think there is, I don't think we'll ever, ever, in terms of ever being the next five years, I don't think we'll reach a, a political consensus or political um, naivete that where anyone would adopt that policy. No, okay. Um, listen, um, it's been really uh, fun and interesting talking to you. The, the, just tell me, before we finish, I mean, what does your average day look like? You spend all your time on construction sites now? Or do you have this sort of very luxurious lifestyle where you get up and go surfing and do yoga every morning? Um, you know, so I, I do yoga, uh, hot yoga, would you believe? Um, at three mornings a week. And do you know, again, we were talking about, I, I, I overspent time in the future and that brought on a lot of kind of psychosis and the way i deal with that is i, I still can't meditate but uh, the voices i get a clearing in the path of my head uh, via rigorous exercise and i'm very fortunate rigorous exercise requires a time window of about three going on four hours just like preparation doing it getting back showering having breakfast you know being you know being ready and, and so I do, I, I spend about four hours being greedy and looking after myself with those activities. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm staying in a, in a buddy's uh, house this week, which is beautiful. Uh, my house is beautiful. St. Bart's is beautiful. Um, so no, no quibbles. Um, so yeah, I, I have a, it, you know, it, superficially it looks pretty cool, but you know, like I say, I get, oh my God, you know, look at those. We don't have enough beach towels for the clients. We don't have enough, you know, no, 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 no. And people are like, calm, 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 please calm down. Well, I, I mean, I, I have that sort of neurotic attitude as well. And if you are a worrier, it doesn't matter what there is out there, you'll find something to worry about. I mean, I completely, I completely get that. Um, just before we go, I wonder if you could just share, um, I like to finish off by asking guests, do you have some advice or a book suggestion for somebody young who's thinking of entering our industry? What book would you recommend a youngster read or another practice or training or? Yeah. Um... I get asked that question a lot, and I, I tend to duck it, but I, I, I won't this time. Um, so again, reading is very important. I, I, we've, I've had that conversation with you. You know, I, you, you should be reading a lot. Um, I think there's an error in uh, having your reading list too pre-subscribed for 
you know, like the 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 silo of finance and so there's just particular books that you, that you are master of uh, you should read wide uh, inspiration is everywhere uh, for entering this domain today is really really hard and you, and I what I say to people is you, you've got a glimmer you know you've got a glimmering glow you've got to be the most enthusiastic person because it makes you know my my gig on the, you know on on screens is I'm passionate and it's a secret energy that kind of comes out the volume speaker and it, it passes over people it's a glue and and so you imagine these hedge fund partners and big banks they're inundated with like sm like being smart is not the answer right smart people are 10 a penny right smart's not the answer right it is uh, smart plus like you leave an impression so by all means and indeed there, there are titles that you have to be on top of and I would, for me it was Jesse Livermore and all the Jesse Livermore books um, and of Jack Schwager um, and countless others Do you know the one the great one for me was uh, Fisher and super stocks which and I when we talked about rear I said it was on 1.6 times EV to sales uh, the um, and that's a book about EV to sales and like and why you shouldn't use price earnings ratios. That was very powerful. But you know, read uh, John Buchanan, the gap, the gap and the curtain, and read read fiction. And because I mentioned gap and the curtain, um, just because I read that and I thought that's a tale about what I do. Again, I use this as a mechanism to as, as as therapy for myself. You recommended that book to me about ten years ago, and I went out and bought it. I, I was really quite. I was really quite surprised and very clever. So I, I'll put that in, in the show notes. Hugh, um, thank you so much for taking the time. Out of, uh, I hope I haven't kept you from the beach or the yoga class. <laughs> no, you I have to tell you. I, I have a meeting with the architect. I'm late, so I'm going to go to that. All right. Well, I'm sorry to keep you, but I have to tell you, in, if it's any consolation, in London, it's a cold, wet day. It, is, it feels like Glasgow on a bad day, you know. So, thank you so much. Well, apologies for the sound. Henry, my brilliant sound engineer, has done his best. But at times the sound quality was a bit patchy, my apologies. But hopefully the content more than made up for it. As I said at the start, Hugh has not entirely given up his Bloomberg. He may be embarked on a very different business and a different lifestyle, but I would be amazed if he didn't turn up as a macro investor in some capacity before too long. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget, visit the website, sign up for our free newsletter, and we'll let you know about upcoming podcasts. This podcast was brought to you by Maison Blanc Bleu, an outstanding luxury villa on St. Bart's. Six beds, a 15 meter pool, a gym, from $40,000 per week or $180,000 over Christmas. Visit bitbit.ly forward slash Bart's Villa. That's bit.ly forward slash Bart's Villa. And send us a postcard.